night on Noticias Telemundo en Español. Uh, and one of the cool things about getting to work behind the scenes is there's this moment and, and whenever we see it, we crowd around. We do it here in LA. Anytime we see a live feed of Jose getting ready to do the news, you see this insane ability for his brain to just be in English and Spanish, English and Spanish. <laughs> He'll be, he'll, you know, he'll be talking to different people in different languages and then boom, he goes in and he either presents in Spanish and presents in English. So Jose, thank you so much for joining us. I just, I want to jump in and ask, you're a pioneer in this bilingual reporting. Uh, how do you keep it all straight at the same time? Well, Gotti, first, thank you. And uh, it is, uh, uh, I, I think it's really important to uh, say how much I admire you and how much, and I've had the opportunity to work by your side for some years now. Um, and it's really uh, comforting to know that you are uh, continuing to succeed, but always with uh, what that which is important as part of your compass in life and, um, and, and as a professional as well. So um, I'm really happy to be uh, by your side. Guy. <laughs> and, um, you know, I, I do... I, I think that the, the, the difference is, are we bilingual or are we bicultural? And I think when you become, when you're able to be bicultural, uh, it's like both languages live with the same weight in your heart, your mind, and in your soul. I dream in Spanish and in English. I think in Spanish and in English. I pray in Spanish and in English. I read in Spanish and English. So so there are times, Gotti, when the languages do collide in your mind. And, you know, Monday through Friday, I'm strictly in Spanish mode. Um, todo es en español de lunes a viernes, preparándome para el noticiero de Telemundo. And then Friday, uh, and to prepare for NBC Nightly News on, on Saturday. But there is uh, there are moments of collision. Gotti in in those languages. It's it's incredible. I mean, you can tell that it's a, a life lived of being so fluent in both languages, and it's something that I inspire uh, to, to be at some point. Unfortunately, my family, uh, my my Spanish is nowhere near that. But just seeing you seamlessly transition between the two, uh, one, it makes me. Uh, it inspires me and two, makes me realize that I should have listened to my dad when I was growing up and <laughs> his, him stressing the importance of, you know, speaking the language and embracing Spanish. So uh, we've got a lot of young journalists that are joining us today. Um, any advice for them when it comes to, to navigating both these languages? And, and do you think that language is going to play a, a bigger role uh, in the future? A bigger role every single day. And my advice would be cultiven el castellano. Cultivate Spanish. And I know that our parents are constantly telling us that. And it's really not good enough just to have abuela Spanish. Uh, right. The opportunity to speak with your grandparents in, in a language gives you that. But you need much more. You really do need to cultivate your language skills. And it's more important every day. And, and I think, Gotti, about, you know, the collaboration that NBC News has had with Noticias Telemundo um, over the past well, year now, uh, where we're able to actually speak in Spanish and in English. The same story that we do for NBC Nightly News airs on the same night at Noticias Telemundo. And Gotti, you've been really one of the pioneers of that. Uh, I ask you, what has been your biggest challenge? And since you aren't, uh, you didn't grow up speaking both languages completely fluidly, what has been the biggest challenge and, and the reward? So I think for me, the biggest challenge is just getting familiar with the language. There's, a, there's two different types, like you said, the abuela Spanish and the, the Spanish where you have to broadcast to the nation. Uh, and that is a very daunting undertaking. So. This sounds very dumb, but uh, recently what I've been doing is I, I read, I try to read out loud to just soltar la lengua, like to, to, to make them, because the mouth and the movements are, are very crucial, especially when it comes to enunciating and getting that uh, pronunciation perfect. So I've been reading, <laughs> I've been reading a, a new story 
full on through and through, uh, the longer the better, usually from the LA Times in Spanish. And then I've been reading uh, a little bit of Harry Potter in Spanish because it's just, it's a much easier read and it's a lot more conversational. So uh, that, that's kind of helped me. But what it's done is it's unlocked, it's unlocked this ability to reach um, two different generations here in the United States that uh, oftentimes I think in the past have been apart because of this language. And for some reason, and I, I want to say that the NBC and Telemundo have some role in this, but it's all of a sudden okay to embrace both heritage and embrace this identity and be yourself. And so I'm, I'm hoping that the continuation of that and the hearing of Spanish and English in conversations as well as on the news is something that will kind of help foster a, a little of that, a little bit of that on a societal level. You know, I, I want to just, you know, point out that there are some extraordinary journalists that are working both at NBC News and at Noticias Telemundo that have been able to contribute and to serve uh, our communities uh, in this collaboration. You know, Morgan Radford and Nicole oh, yeah. Suarez, Julio Vaqueiro, Gabe Gutierrez, Guadalupe Venegas. And then even like I think of my colleague, old friend Kerry Sanders, right? <laughs> These incredible correspondents that covered wars and dolphin pods. <laughs> Everything. And there have been times when I'm thinking of the Iraq war that he actually collaborated with Noticias Telemundo in his Spanish. He grew up some years in Peru. Um, and so there's an opportunity for all kinds of people that have their different sensitivities to participate and serve. And it's really, you know, when we're thinking of the strength of the Latino community in the, in the United States, it's growing every single day. And yet until now, many times we have really been invisible in, in a lot of places, you know, and, and, you know, the fact that Cesar Conde now is really making this incredible push in NBC news properties. Um, for all of us to be represented. Um, it, it's never been more important uh, that there are journalists that speak different languages, but also are part of different communities that are really part of different communities. Not just because your name is sounds Latino. No, you people who are really comprometidos con su comunidad, people who are from a community and that don't want to leave it on the contrary, want to serve it. And you've got to do that by being over-prepared. And you must perfect your Spanish. Mm -hmm. My biggest regret is that I don't speak more than just two languages fluently. I wish I could speak more languages fluently. <laughs> and I'm thinking, Gotti, one of the things that I'd love to be able to speak fluently, and I can kind of get by and not even abuelo, tatarabuelo, French. French. Uh, I, I wish I could speak French better. Why? Because I, I'm thinking of the, the, the our Haitian brothers. Right. Right. That you know, part of our world, the Americas, right? You have English, French, Portuguese, mm -hmm. Brazil. These are all part of the American fabric. Mm -hmm. And and I wish, although Creole is not French, I know that, but you can get by. If you speak French and certainly uh, get by, you know, understanding some of, of Creole and, and communicating. I just wish that we all were so were, realize how important it is to speak other languages. I, I think mine would be Portuguese. And I've got two little nieces who are, are half Brazilian. And so we we speak a little bit of Portuguese and they're always making fun. Uh, of my Portuguese. But Brazil is another place where, you know, Brazil is one of those countries that I love because you go down there, you can tell, even though sometimes you can't understand the language, they are Latino, you know, and uh, and you feel it and you find the, the similarities everywhere. But the, the wonderful thing about you, a lot of the places that I've been to in Brazil is just this, this this idea that we're all in this together and they are all Brazilian and they all yeah. look different, but they're all connected by this love of this language and this culture that transcends races. And, and, so 
Absolutely. When you go to Brazil, you know, Sao Paulo is so different from Brasilia, is so different from Rio, Minas Gerais. It, it, everything is another world. And yet, as you say, there is a co cohesive uh, feeling of we are all in this together. And that's why I think that bringing it back to the folks that could be watching us today is the future is ripe for people who can speak different languages, but more than that, who are part of communities and that want to serve those communities. It's really empowering to see, for example, that, you know, the inaugural coming up next, next Wednesday, JLo is going to be there. Mm -hmm. and, you know, we've seen inaugurals in the past where, you know, Richard Blanco, a, a, a Latino poet uh, spoke uh, at the inaugural. Mm -hmm. uh, but we in the media are the ones that can best focus, help these apparatos shine a light on those who really aren't often listened to or focused upon in the past. Now, I'll say, I want to ask for those aspiring journalists who are just now getting into this, um, how did you get your start? And how do you see the world differently and maybe some of the career trajectories and the ladders and the steps that you took uh, starting to change? How, how do you see those reconciling these days? Boy, and I want to ask you about your steps too. <laughs> uh, but but I, I think that, you know, how I started 34 plus years ago in journalism <laughs> is unique. And, and it's certainly, I don't know if it's possible today, uh, but I'll give you a quick Boceto, a quick outline. In in uh, you know, I started in local radio, graduating from college. Got a summer job in local radio. Uh, you know, I would had the greatest job that I thought in the world, which was I'd have to go there at four a.m. to the record to the uh, radio uh, station, open it up, start the machines, mop and clean. But then I got to see, push the buttons, and see the the machines, the UPI and AP machines that had reams of paper, like in typewriting style of breaking news. And, and it was like such a different wild world for me as a young man. I was like, this is, this is like Star Trek stuff that, that news comes out of these teletype machines from all over the world. How did that happen? So I went one day when I was home for summer vacation or Christmas vacation uh, in Miami, and I and I found out where United Press International had its offices, and I knocked on the door. And I said, "Hi guys, I'm just a local radio reporter. I, how do you guys do this? Get world from all uh, news from all over the world." And the the bureau chief, Kurt Frank, still a journalist today, uh, said, "Come on in, kid. I'll show you." He showed me the thing, and I said, "Hey, can I can I work here?" And he was like. No, but <laughs> want to take a writing test. And so I took a writing test. And then a couple of months later, he called me and he says, you want to do an entry level job here? And I was like, yes. <laughs> so then, and this is why I'm telling a story because about languages. So this is now April of 1984, right? I'm just starting in UPI, writing and editing. And these riots break out in the Dominican Republic, April of 1984. It ended up 60 people got killed, uh, hundreds arrested because of the rise of prices of medicine and food overnight. People couldn't deal with it. They went to the street. The army came out and shot people, 60 people dead. Well, they wanted not a stringer, a reporter from United Press International to go in. And there was no reporter in the east of the United States that spoke wow. in 1984 in wow. United Press International. Nobody spoke Spanish. So then I go, hey, I, I, yo lo español. I, okay, let me go. So I said, get on a plane and go. So I covered those riots. It changed my life, what I saw and what I witnessed. But I covered those riots for United Press International because I could speak Spanish. And because I could speak Spanish, I went into the areas where people were more most suffering and where 
the pain was most intense. And I was able to cover those riots from a perspective of people who were suffering, really, really suffering. In their language, I was able to speak to them. And then from there, Spanish language television called sometime later. And from there, here we are today in 2021, I'm pretty much doing the same thing I was doing in 1984. But now on, on TV, and the privilege of my life is to be able to work at Noticias Telemundo and NBC Nightly News. But it's because I spoke Spanish mm -hmm. and that I knocked on doors. Right. Uh, because, you know, UPI in 1984 was, you know, the gold standard of international journalism. Uh, and I just knocked on the door because I wanted to know how that stuff worked. Right. I'm still trying to figure out how a lot of this stuff works. So much is changing, Gotti, and that's why I want to get to you, because the teletypes of 1984 uh, are the, the, the smartphones and, the, and, and all of the things that we're using today and that you're using today and, and in this extraordinary news program that you're just starting on Peacock, but also using the, the, the social media in, in a way to inform and empower our communities. How did you get into this? Well, I mean, it's funny because I feel like I bridged the two worlds. I've got the, you know, one foot in the digital side and then one foot in the, in the very old school side. And on my mom's side, my, my uncle, my great uncle was, he was a correspondent way, way back in the day for NBC News. Um, so he would tell us some stories. And then when we moved to the United States from Guatemala, we lived in this small town, Belen, New Mexico. Um, and we were, we were pretty, we were pretty poor. And my dad was working two jobs. He was delivering pizzas uh, and he was working as a carpenter. And I remember he went up from Belen to Albuquerque to deliver some pizzas to Univision, deliver some pizzas to Univision. And they give him a tour and he goes in the back and he's seeing the set and he's like, Hey, this set looks halfway done. And they're like, yeah, our contractor skipped out on us. So my dad's like, pues, in Guatemala, I, 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 <laughs> professional, siempre. so he, next thing you know, he's, he's like building, finishing the set there. And so <laughs> he, he worked there for a while uh, on the set. And then one day, you know, they had this show. They, they're like, he's pretty funny from Guatemala. Like sit him down on the couch and interview him. So they interview him and he just, my dad, he's a character, so he steals a the show. They're like, get him on TV. So they give, they make him the weatherman. They give him a bingo show. And so uh, they don't pay him anything, but it was still a huge opportunity. And so me and my brothers, like we grew up going to Univision and carrying my dad's tripod around and, and editing tape to tape and, you know, doing all these things. And so it was fun because he would, he would take us on these trips. And I was like, wait, this is what uncle Neil does. And this is what you're now doing. And you just have this, you just have this pass into wherever you go. And I remember he took us, I mean, we're from New Mexico. So the, the one that I remember the most is when I think I was like eight or nine and he's like, and I'm like, where are you going? Jersey, Jersey. So we get in the car, we drive down to Roswell. It's this UFO convention Ooh. and he's like getting to interview everybody. And I'm like, we get to talk to all these people. And, and I remember just being so captivated at the ability to just cut through and, and get to stories that it, it spoke to me. So long story short, um, when I got into college, I was down at NMSU. I know that there's some UTEP people here. Hi, UTEP, we love you. Uh, so down at NMSU, there was this News 22 thing, jumped into that. And then this email came from this renowned photographer named John Goheen, and he was looking for a Spanish speaker to go down to Mexico, and he wanted to profile a family that was going from Mexico, from Oaxaca, up to the up to the United States. And they made this yearly journey every year. They'd work in the onion fields in Colorado. And so I raised my hand, and he was like, sorry, I'm sorry. There you go. The yeah. The raising and, of the hand. And he tells me, position's been filled. We already found somebody. And I was like, uh, yeah, but but hold on. Like, you, you probably, you definitely need some. And he's like, no, sorry, we already have somebody. And I was like, please, I'll pay everything. I don't even, I don't want any money. I just want to come. Like, please, just let me come. Finally, he says, okay, you can go, but just know that you're not, like, I've already got a character. Right. Um, that person ends up dropping out halfway through because it was an arduous 
journey. I mean, we went from Sochiqui La Sala, this tiny little town in, in Oaxaca, all the way through. We crossed the border in Tijuana, uh, into the United States, following this family the whole time. And it was two weeks of just living, sleeping on the floor and living in barrancos. And it was, and that for me was the moment that I truly fell in love with journalism. And it's that, it, it it's this, you know, it unlocks a, a piece of you to to be able to touch stories so deeply that that you know the importance and you know the world needs to know this and and it's not every story that has that but this story in particular for me was one that it was just it, it, it was the most important thing I've, I'd ever held and so from then on it was like okay how do I become a journalist? And then the next thing you know, I'm in LA. The next thing you know, I'm working for the network. And the next thing you know, none of the young people are watching me. So I'm like, darn it, I gotta figure out a way to get get to the get to the young people. And so I've been jumping onto phones ever since. So let me ask you about uh, about bilingualism. I, uh, just about Spanish language, for example, on on TV. I I can remember that one of the privileges of these long decades in in journalism for me. It was on the first day, it was about four or five years ago now, and I had a program on MSNBC. Started out from 9 to 10 in the morning, then it went 9 to 11 in the morning. Uh, I worked with Christine Portella, who's an extraordinary journalist, um, senior producer of that show, among others. Uh, and the first show we had, which I think it was August, uh, was when the first, first real massive wave of um, Latin Americans of, of migrants were coming over the border. This was under Obama. And, um, and there were a lot of problems there. Um, family separations started that. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, everybody was talking about this story and it was like my first show on MSNBC. And I was like, well, why don't we talk to someone who actually experienced that mm -hmm. instead of talking to experts, so-called experts and, university professors as much as we love universities. Um, I said, let's let's speak to someone who crossed the border and has done everything to come to this country. So we found Maria, who is from Honduras and who saw her brother shot and killed in front of her in the front door of her little tiny home in the mountains. Uh, by gang members. And they said, you're next. We're coming for you next. So she got up. She's, I think, 17 or 18. Her sister is in South Florida. She got up and went. And when she got to Mexico, she was, what What happened to that young lady, I, I can't even describe because it breaks my heart and injures my soul today, even today. Um, but she then continued. And she made it to the United States and she made it to the border and I, she made it to the, her sister's house in South Florida. And I said, let's have her on. So on the first program on MSNBC, I had Maria on who didn't speak English. She probably does by now. Sure. As a matter of fact, she wanted to be a nurse. And uh, she spoke in Spanish. I asked her the question in English. Then I translated it into Spanish. And as she spoke, I started translating live. And I don't think it had ever been done before. Mm -hmm. And it was six or seven minutes of someone describing the difficulties of existing and how she needed to be here. There's no expert that could tell you that. There's no academician who could explain that. And so when do we use translations or when do we have that experience on English language television. Gotti? Uh, if it's up to me, every single time. And, and there's a couple of reasons. Um, one, we're humans. And so much of what we say is in our face. And so when you don't understand the language and you're watching somebody describe something, you're tapping into this universal humanness that everybody understands. And a lot of times when, when I'm watching something and I don't speak the language, but I can tell the spirit of what they're saying, you, you don't want to get in the way of that. You, you, you want to allow that type of energy to flow. 
And, and oftentimes when we, when we come in and do the simul translations, it's almost like you have a friend or it's almost like my little brother, for example, he speaks perfect Portuguese. And when we go down to Brazil, he's doing all the simul translations and, and it allows me to feel not removed. I feel as a part of, of the experience. And so when you're doing a simul translation and, and you're saying, and, and they're able to experience that person's emotion and they're able to experience that person, that person's, uh, Aura. I, I don't. I don't know how to better describe it. It's. It's their. Their being at that moment, and then you have somebody filling in the blanks. It is such a powerful and unforgettable moment, uh, and it also unites us. It. It makes you, as opposed to having like this disembodied voice come from somewhere else. All of a sudden, the viewer, the person being interviewed, and the correspondent, they all have this experience together. And I, I, yeah, I, I wonder if if. We are, I'm just wondering this, you know, if, if, if this happened to you and I, and we were in, I don't know, Srebrenica or in, in Bosnia or in, you know, uh, and uh, Croatia or something, and then someone speaking in Cyrillic, a Cyrillic language, and, and there some, the correspondent is translating, would it seem interesting to us to hear a language we don't have any relationship with? Uh, expressed by someone who's, you know, simul translation. As long as I can see their faces, for me, yes. For the the human face is 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 the first language, right? And I do feel that a lot of times when when you have subtitles or you have the dubbing, you're distracted by a lot of different things, so you're not able to focus on that face. Sometimes when you don't understand the language, you're forced to focus on that face and you're forced to focus on that face because you're trying to read what this person is saying. So you have a, a sense of what they're saying before you hear the translation. And then when you do hear the translation, you're taken, and I know this is getting real esoteric, but you're taken back to our primal days, our days where we, where tribes would, would encounter each other and you yeah. didn't understand what was going on. And it was all that nonverbal expression that we had to, to communicate. I yeah, know that's a that's a very a very solid uh, point, and and I'm thinking one of the things that really um, I, I so much admire about you, Gotti, is um, you always bring it back to people in your coverage, and and that's so easily lost. You know what I mean? It's so easily lost on people to just stick with experts, so-called experts, people who you have in your electronic Rolodex. And so you just call them and they know how to say a soundbite better than anybody in the world. I need a 12 second soundbite. They'll fill that 12 seconds in 1139. Uh, but what I really admire about you is that you always do bring it back to that essential point, which is us, all of us, humans. And I was thinking of, you know, last Saturday on NBC Nightly News, you had a story when we're talking about the disproportionate effect that COVID is having on the Latino community in the United States. I mean, just to think about Los Angeles, right, where since November, the number of deaths in the Latino community has have gone up 800 percent in just L.A. County alone. And, you know, last Saturday on Nightly News, you, you had a story that was in English for the English language viewer only uh we didn't do it on noticias telemundo that day we've done it every day but not that day by Gotti schwartz and you had not only the victims of covid and how they're suffering but also how the healthcare workers the people that are saving lives are latino as well and you let that breathe it, it's it's uh i just want to applaud you for that Gotti, because you never you never lose the the brujula the the compass of what it is that we're supposed to be doing thank you so much jose and i, I gotta tell you and this is just a an observation from somebody that watches you on both networks it it, it speaks to exactly what we're talking about you have a way of presenting where i know at all times that you're watching and you're feeling what there is to feel and that's tough to do in journalism because it's overwhelming. Like we, we are overwhelmed by the amount of confusion and the amount of pain and the, the amount of suffering. 
And, and oftentimes when you show that emotion, it becomes somewhat of a distraction. And so the true masters are those that can show that humanity while at the same time maintain control. And Jose, you were the best in the business at that. And, and I invite anybody to watch any of your broadcasts in either language and you will always see that. And it's in the tiniest little micro expressions, but those are the types of things that you just, you can't replicate, you can't teach. And so my advice to, to, to people that are just coming up in this industry is to stay true and connected to that compass and that humanity that guides you because there are facts and there are uh, stories that you'll chase in order for you to to be able to communicate effectively with everybody you have to speak that that universal language so jose my biggest thanks to you and to you it's been a privilege to share time with you it is uh so rewarding to see you grow and always maintain as i say your brujula your <laughs> what is it important and, and that's what we all have to really always remember that it should never be about us but rather to utilize the instruments of journalism to let others speak for themselves, give those voices prominence. Jose, thank you so very much. We went, we went so deep. This felt kind of like therapy. So <laughs> thank Wait, you. Before we go, this is a great anecdote. So uh, one of the things that I have a podcast and I have actually on NBC Nightly News films, uh, uh, American Dreaming. It's a, it's, a, it's a series that I do. I invite you all to, to catch it if you can. And, um, you know, we've had Lele Pons and Leguizamo and uh, Gloria Stefan. And soon we're going to have a guy who's really an icon, Don Francisco, Mario. Yeah. And, I've, I've, Gary, I've just got to burn you. you got to tell us that. <laughs> Don Francisco is like the biggest guy on planet Earth, arguably. He is, he is like, you know, Jay Leno times a million. He, no one can hold the stature that Don Francisco can. And we grew up watching Sabado Gigante. And uh, everyone. Uh, I'm sorry? As did everyone in the planet. Yeah, as, yeah, exactly. It was such a fun show. And so I had the weirdest moment when I was about eight, seven or eight. Um, so we lived, my brother and I, we shared the, the uh, this room. We had the master bedroom because we were the messiest in the house. And so um, there was a bathroom there. And, and I remember waking up one morning. It wasn't even, it wasn't even uh, light outside. And I, I open up my eyes and Don Francisco is in my bathroom shaving, the most famous guy in the world. And I'm like, and I tell, I tell my brother, I'm like, hey, Matt, Matt, is that Don Francisco? And Matt opens his eyes, my brother, and he's like, I think it is. And he's like, oh, saludos. And, and then somehow, magically, we just fell back asleep. Uh, I think because of the dream or, or whatever it was, a shared dream. So we wake up later and we go down to, to my mom and my mama. Uh, we, we both had this dream at the same time that Don Francisco was in our, in our bathroom. And she's like, what was he doing? And we're like, he, he was shaving. And she's like, oh, yeah, he came. He came to our house. And your dad is taking him to the balloon fiesta in Albuquerque and his razor broke. So Papa was like, sure, you could just shave in my son's room. So he brought us in. And we're like, we missed him. So uh, I cannot wait to see that episode. Oh, man. So when you're dreaming that Don Francisco is shaving in your room, it's probably true. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. What a great time. I think yeah. that's a great anecdote. Well, thank you guys so very much for joining us. I mean, this is this is the family. This is the NBC family. I'm glad that we got to share it so much. Um, we've got a lot more on our website, NBCUacademy.com, where you can learn more about all of our top tier journalists and our university partnerships all across the country. So, so thank you. We'll see you. Uh, we'll see you this weekend. We'll see you on the news, and uh, and, and we'll see you guys hopefully soon. Thanks. <laughs>